necessary, most noble, and historical effort. God bless us all. Hampshire, England, 9 a.m. Two million troops are now waiting in England for the invasion to begin. Cliff Morris and the men of number six commando, who know they will do battle on D-Day itself, keep themselves busy. Anything to take their minds off what lies ahead. 29th of May. All time is spent playing sports and keeping fit. The camp being very well equipped with football pitches. Perhaps some play on spec of getting a broken arm or leg. No one is lucky enough. British No. 6 Commando, just like the Canadian Regina Rifles and the American 82nd Airborne, will be the first into action when the invasion comes. And yet, they still don't know where they are going or when. They must be kept in the dark till the very last moment. Portsmouth, England, 9.30 a.m. But deep underground in the Allied Command Center are the people who really do know what's happening. Although it is too soon for the fighting men to have all the details, their senior officers have already been led into the D-Day secret. There is a buzz of excitement. The moment that everyone has been working towards for months is drawing near. The invasion will be on the Normandy coast, between the mouth of the River Orne and the Cherbourg Peninsula. It will take place at low tide and by full moon, and it will take place within a matter of days. Monday, May 29, 1944. Eight days to D-Day. Throughout the south of England, thousands of troops, vehicles, tanks, and guns are on the move. It is impossible to disguise such a massive exercise from enemy eyes. But the Allies have a plan to confuse the Germans as to when and where the landings will take place. This strategy of deception is critical to the success of D-Day. If it does not work, the enemy will be ready and waiting for the invasion. The Germans must be led to believe that the most likely place for the assault will not be Normandy, but further north, near Calais. It is the logical choice, because it is where the English Channel is at its narrowest. To support this deception, hundreds of misleading messages are sent daily to German intelligence by people such as Spaniard Juan Pujol, codenamed Garbo. Hendon, North London. Though recruited by the Germans, who still believe he's on their side, Garbo now works for the Allies. From his anonymous suburban home, he bombards the enemy every day with a confusing bulk of material. If he fails, D-Day may fail. A massive fighter attack stop, taking place in the Calais area. A total of 66 squadrons are taking part. Airfields in Kent and Sussex are being used by the planes to rearm and refuel. Like all the best lies, his messages contain elements of truth. Today, the skies over Calais are the target. But the bomber's real objective, when it comes to D-Day itself, will be Normandy. Normandy is also the objective of the U.S. 82nd Airborne. Now on the move in the English Midlands, they will drop behind enemy lines ahead of the main landings. If they fail, the ground troops will never get off the beaches. Their job is among the most dangerous of the entire operation. And yet there is something paratrooper Bill Tucker and his comrades haven't been told. In Normandy, the German 91st Infantry Division has just been mobilized near the drop zone for the 82nd Airborne. The Americans will land in an area now bristling with German soldiers. 
right. Thank you. Goodbye. Portsmouth, England, 10 a.m. Desmond, will you be kind enough to take this to the ACM? Yes, sir. Thank you. No but answer. as Admiral Ramsey notes with regret in his diary, it is too late for Eisenhower to change the plan. It will have to go ahead, even though many paratroopers will die. Monday, May the 29th. A boiling hot day. Commander's meeting at 1000. Settled the airborne drop, not to our satisfaction, but to necessity. Will prove very expensive to life and plane. For four years, France has been occupied by the Germans. Now, finally, liberation is in sight. Sonia d'Artois knows what she has to do. Liaise between resistance cells as they sabotage the Nazi war machine. Le Mans, France, 11 a.m. Unlike the waiting paratroopers, she has safely landed across the channel and is taken to meet her network. Sonia has an ally, British agent Sidney Hudson. He has been in France for several months, mobilizing the partisans for the coming invasion. We were only helpers of the French resistance. We were in far less danger than they were. We were mobile, trained, armed, and um, the, the French farmers and business people who helped us were absolutely sitting ducks for the Gestapo. One such patriot is André Heinz, who, despite his German-sounding name, is a Frenchman. Every day, he risks his life collecting intelligence for the resistance. My French were the same. Young people couldn't bear the thought of the Germans being here. And there's an immediate reaction against their uh, being there. And uh, for one reason, well, it's terribly humiliating to be suddenly occupied by your enemy of the day before. Most mornings, André Heinz comes to Mass to pass on information to his contact. He was not a believer, but still he, he managed to have a, a prayer book that uh, we exchanged during the service. And in his was the questionnaire for next time. And in my book, uh, where all the answers I had been able to gather. But in the last month, his contact has been arrested and thrown into prison. Now, André lives with the knowledge that he, too, might be betrayed. At any moment of the day or night, the Gestapo could come to find him. Only the invasion, if it succeeds, will save him. I would have been not only arrested, but tortured for days sometimes. It depended how, you, how long you could resist, because they wanted to make you give the names of all those that were included in the group. Only a few miles from André Heinz's hometown of Caen, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel inspects the coastal fortifications. He is Germany's most celebrated military leader. His job is to defeat the Allied invasion. On Rommel's orders, the entire coast from Calais to Normandy is now a deadly assault course. There are four million mines in place, and half a million obstacles on the beaches. In return, the Allies are relentlessly bombing northern France. Their aim? To destroy German defenses and sap their will to win. Normandy, France, 1 p.m. Today, as Rommel continues his tour of the Atlantic Wall, he writes to his wife back home in Germany. Monday, May the 29th. Dearest Lucy, the Anglo-Americans in Norway let up from their incessant bombardment. The French suffer from it terribly. In 48 hours, there have been 3,000 dead among the people. And yet Rommel's problems are not confined to the enemy 
His superior, Field Marshal von Rundstedt, has refused his demands for more reinforcements on the coast. Rommel is convinced that he alone should control troop movements, not von Rundstedt. What he does not realize is that the domestic staff in Normandy have connections with the French resistance, and his frustrations are known to the Allies. Das muss nein. Heil Hitler! Hampshire, England, 8 p.m. Rommel's success or failure hinges on throwing the invaders back into the sea. For frontline troops like Glen Dickon, the sight of planes taking off to bomb the enemy offers some comfort. Dear Mom, the European war seems to be reaching a decisive stage now. The Germans are really taking a terrific beating from the aerial bombing. It is a beautiful sight to see. They certainly are making a nice job of softening up the invasion troops. In the southwest of England, the summer sun finally slips below the dunes at Slapton Sands in South Devon. Just over a month earlier, this had been the site of a live ammunition D-Day rehearsal, codenamed Exercise Tiger. It had all gone horribly wrong. Air cover had failed, landing craft were late, and there was confusion on the beachhead. Amphibious tanks had either sunk or wounded their own men as they landed. It was a training exercise in which no one should have died. Instead, 749 soldiers and sailors have been lost. It is a warning. If things can go this badly in a rehearsal, who is to say what will happen on the day itself? Tuesday, May 30th, 1944. Seven days to D-Day. Cottesmore Airfield, 9 a.m. The Allies are preparing for the invasion of Europe. The American 82nd Airborne, with them, Bill Tucker, have reached their final staging post in the English Midlands. We still don't know where we're going. There's all kinds of speculation that it'll be someplace like Norway or Holland. Military police stay with each company at all times, front side and back. No personnel on the airdrome is allowed.